Bismillah, no, you will not think of Bismillah. And that's why the vaxxers, the anti vaxxers, include security. I'm Joe Nickel, and I'm talking to you today about CSI. Now, you've, you've seen the TV series CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, and you know the spin-offs, CSI Miami, CSI New York. This one is CSI Paranormal. And the little irony is that I work with an organization whose name is CSI, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, so it, it's a little uh, double bit of humor there. I have been investigating the paranormal since 1969 when I said in my first seance to contact the spirit of Houdini. He was basically a no-show, but a medium pretended he was there. I met James Randi about that time and have been um, trying to uh, investigate paranormal claims ever since. I spend my days, I am a full-time salaried paranormal investigator, um, maybe the only one around, whose actual job is to investigate paranormal claims. And I travel around the country and around the world investigating claims at the fringes of science. And I actually use the word investigate, and I mean it very seriously. You see the term paranormal investigator used a lot now. Uh, to mean, you know, silly ghost hunter types who have, you know, EMF meters or Geiger counters or something trying to find ghosts, uh, a, a, a fool's errand. But I'm actually trying to investigate, and when I started, I was a, a young, very young magician at the Houdini Hall of Fame, and later I decided to work for a famous detective agency, and I did all sorts of investigative work to sharpen my skills to learn what it's like to really investigate. Because I believe that mysteries should neither be fostered, as happens so often on crappy television shows, nor debunked or dismissed out of hand. But I believe that they should be carefully investigated with a view towards solving. And as I said in an earlier panel today, some of you may have been here, I have tried to use all the resources at my fingertips that I might use to shed light on a mystery. So I have done such things as go undercover and in disguise to a spiritualist center and catch them at tricks, uh, or to otherwise adopt a false persona and do, do something to clarify whether someone is psychic or not. I have used the techniques of folklore, iconography, plain old scholarship, whatever it takes, and I have done a number of things that used forensic science in some way. But to give you an example, 1987 in Atlanta, the Atlanta House of Blood mystery. This was a, an alleged poltergeist type case in which an elderly couple in a house claimed that blood was oozing out of the walls and springing up like a fountain from the floor and so forth. Police were called in and investigated. Police were, as you'll see, not very impressed with this, didn't think any crime had been committed, very suspicious of these claims. But it became uh, sort of part of the uh, folklore and urban legend-making world of the paranormal. And some years later, it was suggested that I might want to look into this now cold case because it was becoming exaggerated and was one of those cases science can't explain. So I was able to go to Atlanta, uh, to the Atlanta homicide headquarters and talk to the, the head of that. And he was willing to bring out for me to see the case file. So I actually was able to look at the crime scene photographs made throughout the house. And as soon as I did, and what I'm trying to do here is illustrate to you the forensic science of blood pattern analysis. And as soon as I had seen those, I knew that blood pattern analysis might solve this case. 
So I had a friend named Judith Bunker, who's a nationally known blood pattern analyst, kind of owed me a favor. I called Judy, and she was quite happy to look at these crime scene photos. And as a result, she could tell from the patterns of the blood that it had actually been splattered on from here to there, spurted, squirted, thrown onto. It was not coming this way, it was going that way. This gave the lie to that couple's claim and showed that this was, in fact, with some other evidence, some of which I'm not at liberty to reveal, but the police closed that case for good reason. People looking for attention is probably all that that was. So there's, a, there's one example of how a forensic case can be solved by, by using, or, or a, a paranormal case, by using forensics when it might not be obvious that that's a tactic or, or a technique. Another one is serological tests, and if you could see this next picture, uh, you would just see an old uh, deserted uh, house and you'd see some streaks. <laughs> Well, this, uh, this curious case happened in uh, eastern Kentucky at a place curiously known as Deadening Branch. And there was a story of a little boy killed in a cane mill accident, his body crushed, and supposedly they used this door to lift and carry his body and lay him out, as they say. And the folklore of the area is that on a rainy day, or after a rain, you would see these bloody streaks would appear on the door. So I arranged, I talked to several people and collected <clears throat> some of the, uh, the folklore involving it, including one of the common folk motifs that applies here is something called the ineradicable blood stain, the blood stain that can never be er eradicated. So a little use of folkloristics in this case. But I want to talk to you about serological tests because, well, it's blood or it isn't. And I was able to take scrapings, but first, I found that you could see where the runoff from the roof had come down and was pooling along the top of this uh, door casing and then was running in trickles down in two places. You could actually just trace that. So it was almost certainly organic matter uh, from the roof, uh, decaying leaves, tar, that sort of thing, whatever would be on a tin roof, rust, that sort of thing, washing down. But nevertheless, I took uh, careful scrapings of this and took it to a forensic laboratory aware of on, it was not blood. Nothing chemically relating to blood was, was shown. So that, again, shows how you can apply forensics to a case of the paranormal. Next, forensic light sources. You've, you've watched CSI and you know that your ability to see things visually is within a limited range. But if you increase that with ultraviolet or infrared or any of a number of sort of tunable wavelengths, you can see other things. And in CSI, you see them use some kind of alternate light sources. So I want to talk to you about that. And the case that I've chosen to illustrate this is one in which uh, happened in mid-1995 in Lexington, Kentucky, when people were sitting in a darkroom seance and uh, they were uh, given little blank swatches of cloth, the lights were turned out, they were given blank swatches of cloth, ink, a ink bottle was opened up on the table and they were told that the spirits would come during the seance and take ink out of the bottle and produce these little thumbprint sized pictures on your cloth of your spirit guides. Yes, people actually paid uh, to have this happen and, and the medium got $800 that evening, and this is back when that was actually significant money, $800. Today, it's, you wouldn't stoop to pick it up, I know, but, but back then, $800 was a lot. And so, uh, we had a complainant, and uh, I was able to get a hold of this particular one with an affidavit. My forensic friend, John Fisher, in his laboratory used argon laser light. Um, we had tried infrared and ultraviolet, it showed nothing, but argon laser light showed, and this is a little hard to see maybe from way back there, but I hope you can see that there's a sort of a stain here. Can some of you see it up close? Okay, so this was very revealing because there's a book with a recipe for how to do this, and so I used the recipe to make these. These are mine, 
which I think you'll agree look just as good and just as authentic as the others. The book is The Psychic Mafia by M. Lamar Keen, and that's a picture of M. Lamar Keen. Uh, would you want to buy a used spirit picture from him? Uh, but he, uh, he reformed and wrote a tell-all book, and I used the recipe out of his tell-all book about Camp Chesterfield, uh, used basically a solvent and a hot iron uh, to transfer pictures onto cloth from newspapers and magazines, and then you, of course, you switch. Uh, you show some blank cloths, you turn the light out, and then you hand out the ones that are already prepared. And again, uh, forensics saved the day, and from that, there's a lot more evidence in all of these cases. I'm just showing you a quick illustration of a point of evidence. In this case, I was able to get police warrants against the particular medium on charges, multiple charges of theft by deception and other counts. We were not able to extradite him, but he never came back to Kentucky uh, doing his nonsense. No discussion of forensics would be any good without microscopy used somewhere. And uh, here I'm looking at something from the Oprah show. Face of Jesus on a miraculous rose petal. Uh, this was not on Oprah's show, but I was on Oprah, 93, I think, uh, on a Good Friday uh, show on miracles live uh, way back years ago. And afterwards, we were sitting in a limo waiting to go to the airport. And one of the religious people asked me casually, have you ever seen the miracle face of Jesus on a rose petal? I had not. And I was able to charm her into letting me take that, promising to give it back to her, which I eventually did. And uh, I studied it, and I studied it under a stereo microscope. My first thought was that this, you know, if you've got a bunch of rose petals, there's probably some random marks and stuff, and you could just see it like seeing pictures in a cloud. It was a surprise to me to find that there are really no markings on rose petals uh, like this. But this is backlit, so these are transparent um, spots. And you can see, perhaps, it's easier to see in a stereo microscope, everywhere that there's a sort of mark. You can actually see markings as if a tool as if a tool had been used to, to draw this. And everywhere there were these markings, there was damage, physical damage to the rose petal. So the microscope showed what you couldn't see at all, even with ordinary magnifying glass, wouldn't have really shown you. But a low power stereo microscope showed very well. And naturally, I made some. <laughs> Those are mine. And I hear the applause in the next one. <laughs> there it is in color, by the way. And I think mine are, are good enough. Okay, fingerprinting. Now, most of you don't know this story, but this is, this is historically a really important forensic case. Uh, the, the, the case that actually made fingerprinting in America. This is the case known as the case of the two Will Wests. And... Excuse my back for a moment while I turn to the right spot. It was 1903, and the guy whose mug shots you see at the top, named Will West, was brought into Leavenworth Penitentiary on a charge of manslaughter. And the clerk, the records clerk, this is before fingerprinting. 1903 in America, there was no fingerprinting being used. And the clerk thought he recognized him. The guy said, no, I've never been here before. But he ran his measurements. At that time, they were using something called Bertillonage. And Bertillonage was a method of measuring the body in detail and filing it, you know, height, outstretched arms, length of foot, right ear, that sort of thing, and was used to identify criminals. I'll go back. Out came the picture at the bottom. I invite you to look closely at this. Notice the shape of the nose. Notice the square cut of the head here. Notice the similarities of the ear. Um, this is a remarkable case. As was said, they denied uh, knowing each other. Remarkable case. Some books have said this is the most amazing case of two unrelated lookalikes in human recorded human history. The case of the two Will Wests and, of course, the fingerprint guys were waiting for a moment like this. The young guys who knew that there was this new fingerprinting thing, they were waiting. They could go in and show these are, we can tell them apart every time. 
Bertillonage couldn't because their measurements even were very similar. In fact, their measurements are so similar that they were within measurement error. You know, d different people pressing the calipers a little tighter or something, you would get this kind of, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yes, Will West and William West. Uh, now, now, at this point, I can, I can just almost hear the skepticism rippling back through here. And I had grown up as a kid on this story, later became a skeptic, came back to this story, and I said, wait a minute, I don't believe this anymore because this is just too good to be true. I believe these may have been identical twins separated at birth. And this was my working hypothesis, which I proceeded to investigate. Now, there were remarkable cases of lookalikes. The case of uh, Adolf Beck, poor, poor Adolf Beck, who uh, served a term in uh, 1896 for the uh, crimes of William Thomas there on the right, and then in 1904 almost served a second term for the same guy. Uh, they don't look that much alike, do they? And yet, I don't know how well you can see in the back, but trust me on this, but basically what's happening is they are similar types of burly guys with walrus mustaches sort of thing. Um, if you saw one and then later somebody brought in and said, was this the guy, you might identify him wrongly. Uh, similar types. But look at the fingerprints. Double loop pattern here, plain whorl pattern here, nothing even remotely similar. Fingerprinting, bingo, could tell them apart. So we know now, we know when you have fingerprints, that's the means of identification you should use. Here are Bill and Will West's thumbprints. Uh, for those of you who aren't experts, let me just tell you that these are not the same print. Science would never have any trouble separating one from the other. And yet, it is a not rare but somewhat scarce uh, pattern type called a, a lateral pocket loop whorl, and they both have the same uh, one on their finger. I can go further and tell you that they each had the same fingerprint pattern on the same fingers of each hand. I can also tell you that I proceeded with more information. Of course, today we would just use DNA, wouldn't we? But they didn't have that in 1903. They didn't even have fingerprinting. And this is a cold case. So I'm trying to get genetic information for my hypothesis of twinship. And I had their facial features examined by the guy who had invented and developed Identikit, you know, where you put the, the police put eyes, nose, mouth together and make a composite picture. He said, the face of one is the face of the other, as far as the is concerned. They're just indistinguishable. I took their ear patterns. We enlarged those. FBI helped me with this. I got access to these files and everything, courtesy of the FBI. And it turns out that I was able to get the world's foremost expert in ear comparisons, Alfred Inarelli. And Al told me that he had never seen two ears so similar except in the case of identical twins, that even fraternal twins would not have ears this similar. Well, <clears throat> I think I'm proving my hypothesis to you. You don't have to believe it. But let me just mention a couple of other points of data. We found in the old records, lost, nobody paid any attention, their correspondence log. While they were in Leavenworth, Bill and Will wrote to the same brother, the same five sisters, and the same Uncle George. Coincidence? There was a deposition of a fellow prisoner named George Bean who deposed that he personally knew both Will West and William West at their home in this territory and of his own personal knowledge knew them to be, quote, twin brothers, and so on. So uh, why the, the, the confusion or deception? They obviously knew they were related. Uh, when they discovered that, I don't know, but they were, that they were twins seems overwhelmingly proved, and I published this in the Journal of Police Science, and I've spoken to, the, to uh, uh, forensic conferences about this case. So this is uh, how you can use forensic science, uh, even on an old case. Another case, using, using now today, we would use DNA, and the case I've chosen is the case of an alien hybrid, that's right, I don't make this stuff up. Uh, this case, <laughs> uh, this is a real uh, preserved fetus. It dates from 1735 in Saxony, Germany. 
Um, I've been there. The uh, little museum that it's in uh, was quite willing. It's amazing. People will give you access and all kinds of help and things if you, if you have some credentials and ask for it, um, even the FBI. Um, but this museum just was happy to let me uh, look at this jar and get it out for photography and everything because they knew that this was a silly claim that this was an alien hybrid because they had actually tested this. And they had the whole records and everything, and I got those, and I brought them to our readership at Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine. And it turns out that this was a stillborn female, had two X chromosomes. Large parts of chromosome 17 were missing, and the DNA was only human. So you can figure out what that means. Not alien, it's not a hybrid, it's human but it's freakish because of a missing chromosome. And of course, it was so hugely, horribly deformed as a fetus, it couldn't survive, and so it was still born. Uh, but DNA has solved that one. Question document examination. This is a field uh, more uh, to my heart, though I don't call myself a forensic expert. Um, I'm co-author of a forensic textbook, uh, but I do uh, routinely authenticate or not rare historical documents. And this is a book I did that uh, established me in that field. This is another one, Detecting Forgery. And um, has gotten me VIP tours of the Secret Service Document Lab and other places. But uh, this particular case I want to mention to you is, and you've all heard of this case, you know about the Roswell incident, the flying saucer that crashed in the Southwest uh, in 1947. And at the time, it was said to be a weather balloon. We now know what it really was. It was a secret United States government spy balloon from Project Mogul. That is, we were sending up a balloon train with uh, these corner radar reflectors, sort of foiled paper and sticks, uh, like, kind of like a box kite that would attract the radar uh, pick, so it could be picked up very readily. And we were trying to get way up high with these balloon trains, and the recording devices on them were, were to pick up Soviet um, nuclear test explosions way up high so they could pick up the sonic uh, information. Didn't work very well and they lost a balloon in the direction of the Mac Brazel Ranch. And you can read for yourself in the Roswell Daily Record where Mac Brazel came into town and mentioned that what he had found were um, sticks, tape, foiled paper, rubber, a perfect description of Project Mogul. And I have personally talked to Charlie Moore, an elderly man now from Project Mogul, who has identified this as almost certainly from their lost Mogul balloon array. But why is this a question document case? Because questioned documents were shown on a roll of film, which meant the film showed up. You didn't know where it came from. It showed documents with text and so forth, uncovering how the government had hidden the awful secret of the aliens that they had hidden away and so forth and so on. And of course, being on a roll of film, you couldn't actually test the paper or test chemically test the ink or whatever, looked to me like a pretty clever ploy. Well, some of us set to work on these, and it turns out this is a signature from an authentic Harry Truman document, and this is the signature on the question document. And before you think, well, it must be authentic because that really matches. No, it exactly matches. This is the very Truman document that was photocopied, cut out, pasted up, and used on the bogus document. You can't, I don't know if you know this, you can't sign your name exactly the same way twice. You can't do it. And flaw for flaw, that's the same signature. There were other flaws. I photographed this, made this micrograph using um, a reticle that, that gave me crosshairs. You can see that the 24 is out of alignment, the typewriter here. So somebody sort of a typed part and then later decided to go back and fill in the date after he'd done a little research. And uh, so they were just bogus documents. Everything about it 
but that's just a couple of the document uh, points that were uh, uh, easily exposed by forensics. Forensic linguistics, now we're getting into not the actual ink and handwriting and so forth, but language. And we're getting a little dicier here, but the case I've chosen to show you is a case involving the late Abraham Lincoln. At Lilydale, the spiritualist uh, village in upstate New York, and here it is. A message from Abraham Lincoln from the other side, produced during a darkroom seance in the 19th century, in which Lincoln is, you know, sort of admitting that he was, shouldn't have been a skeptic about the spirit world. Now, um, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but that handwriting doesn't look anything, anything like Abraham Lincoln's handwriting. And I don't know if you've read the Gettysburg Address or any of other Lincoln's magnificent writings, the Bixby Letter, for example, and so forth. But you all are aware, are you not, that Abraham Lincoln's command of the English language was superb? And so he would have not written, hopefully even as a spirit, uh, he would have not written should of when he meant should have. <laughs> Anybody believe that? But, but I... But uh, um, uh, so this is forensic linguistics. I actually went through this not just as a handwriting case, but also a language. And this is not Abraham Lincoln. And in fact, it matches pretty closely the handwriting of the medium. If he used a disguised hand, it could account for for this uh, fake fake writing. Uh, a disguised hand is when you just try to maybe write backhanded or make it look like it's not your handwriting your traits will show up, but it'll look different. So it could have been a disguised handwriting of the medium. It was not, whatever it was, Abraham Lincoln's. I'm moving along fast because I lost time and I uh, have a lot to cover, but next I want to talk about photographic analysis. And I've chosen a couple of cases. This one is the case of the Golden Door photos. Um, at various, um, at various Marian apparition sites, which were more popular back in the 80s and 90s. Some of you may remember these cases. A visionary would uh, be in touch with the Virgin Mary, and Mary would give her messages, and she would relay them to people. The messages were, were sort of on the nature of abortion is bad and pray the rosary, messages like that. And so they would often take Polaroid cameras, pilgrims would, go to these sites where the holy person was, and take pictures of the sun hoping for a sun miracle. And sometimes they would get a picture like this. The round ball of the sun is missing. Instead is this arched doorway effect flooded with golden light. And pilgrims believed that this was the doorway to heaven mentioned in the book of Revelation. And uh, these are not, let me tell you, let me assure you, these are not faked pictures in any way. People, you could have been one, you could have done this and gotten a picture like that. So people were very astonished by it. Uh, sometimes they were quite beautiful. I think that's a really a striking, stunning picture. But to make a long story short, if you looked into the Polaroid one-step camera, you would see this is the shape of the lens aperture. It is exactly that shape that we're talking about. So what it is, it's not the doorway to heaven. It's just the doorway to the camera. <laughs> and so whenever you see a golden door picture, you know what make and model of camera it was. It was a... Polaroid one step. They're now not being used much, so that miracle is kind of over and done with. But that <laughs> photo analysis, and some of my friends at Georgia Skeptics had worked assiduously on that, and I worked with them some, and we did that. The other case I want to show you, the case of the Sullivan brothers. This is the ship, the USS the Sullivans, and it's in named in, in honor of the death of the five Sullivan brothers in World War II who were not killed on this ship. This, is a new, this was a newer ship christened with their name to honor the five of them that died, five brothers dying in, in, in World War II. And the story is that if you go into the little galley area of the ship where there are pictures of the five brothers on the wall, and I'll show you this in a minute, and you take a photograph of those five photographs, one of them, 
will come out blurred and mysterious every time. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Let's see if that happens. So I went to said ship, and I used my camera, and bingo. It happens every time. Now, it was clear to me, though, what was happening. Because when you go in, you, nearly, you, you could have a hidden camera, and we'd see we would all just pretty much do this. You pretty much go and stand kind of square in front of the five, right? So everybody's standing more or less the same place. And so it's the center one, the one that's going to bounce the flashback, that's going to do this. Now, it doesn't look like an ordinary flash being bounced back, because you'll often see a really a hot spot or something when that happens, right? But this is very diffused, so this is, this is the value of going on site uh, and knowing sort of what to look for. Uh, I went up close, and I'm using my magnifier. This is non-glare glass. Ta-da! So, proof of that. Now, uh, a couple of other things. Uh, quickly, I'm going to try to finish up and have some time for questions. I'm moving along very fast, <laughs> maybe too fast. Crime scene reconstruction. I have been lucky in life to be able to work with police on some homicides and question death investigations. I've been on a forensic dig to dig up the skeleton of a, of a woman and a bullet. And so I appreciate what's done with crime scenes to secure a scene and uh, grid it so that evidence can be mapped, uh, photographed, and so forth. The whole business of crime scene work is very, very important. And from that work, you can uh, attempt to reconstruct what the crime was and how it happened. Blood pattern analysis, which we talked about earlier, uh, for example, will often show you that a suspect's story can't be true because uh, here's the evidence written in blood that the body was dragged through blood that was already on the floor. This doesn't fit the story. Or um, they claim that the blood that was on them uh, happened when they bent over their loved one to whatever. No, it's actually splattered on from a fierce blow and so forth. So uh, all of the forensics, fingerprinting and serology and all the things we've talked about uh, might go into a crime, stream, crime scene reconstruction. And the case I've chosen for you today is one involving the mystery of spontaneous human combustion. And this is a real case that happened in England and is a very mysterious uh, case. But when you look at it, now this woman's body, the believers in spontaneous human combustion will tell you, uh, no way these people can catch on fire. Their body is burned so thoroughly that even the bones are calcined, very almost like a crematorium. And nearby objects like this ottoman are not appreciably damaged and so forth. And, and in some cases, it's very mysterious. But we've begun to get a handle on this. I have worked for years on this phenomenon, and, and uh, my work got into fire and arson journals and into eventually into a textbook. So I have worked assiduously on this matter. But this one, I think, is pretty easy to solve, and I think I, uh, at least some of you in the foreground here who can see it, maybe you can solve this case for us uh, pretty quickly. Does anybody here see a possible source for the ignition? <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. This is, I know this is hard because it stumped a lot of believers in spontaneous human combustion, so it, it can't be easy. But does anybody see any kind of possible source for the for the ignition. Well, maybe I could uh, help you out a little bit here. This is a drawing I did. Um, uh, th this pen and ink drawing took me a lot of time, but I was recovering from a broken leg and I had nothing better to do. I would never spend this much time on a drawing uh, again. But um, you can, you, first thing you notice is that the woman apparently uh, has a shoe, well, does have a shoe missing. And so uh, it could have, uh, she could have been trying to put on a shoe and fell or, she could have uh, stumbled over something and lost the shoe, but this is probably relevant to what happened. She fell where? <clears throat> Help me out here. That's right, she fell onto the fireplace. And as proof that she did, the grate has been knocked sharply to the left. You see here? Whereupon, 
Uh, let's hope she was killed or severely addled, and that was the end of that for her. Uh, sparks have showered out onto the body where there's a lot of body fat. It's in the torso and the upper thighs where we humans have so much body fat, it's very flammable. If you've ever caught a skillet of grease on fire, you will have no, no uh, thoughts that that's not very flammable material, grease. And uh, what's happening is that the clothing or carpeting is often absorbing that and acting as a sort of wick effect. It's actually called the wick effect now. Um, so that it's a very efficient burning, can, in the way that a candle is burning with a wick efficiently. And so the person is burning over and over and over and over. There's never a very big fire, but it's burning over and over and over. And it's never very hot, so it's not burning nearby objects. And it's proceeding where there's, where there's fat, but then it eventually will just quit because fire doesn't burn laterally very well, and it's not having a, a big supply of body fat anymore, and it just goes out for natural reasons may have used up some of the oxygen. Here it didn't probably because that there would be, there'd be uh, air coming down the chimney. But that's a crime scene reconstruction or that's the principles of that being used to explain a case of spontaneous human combustion. Psychological autopsy, this is controversial a bit, but, um, but I buy into the, the general hypothesis that when somebody has died and the, there's a possibility that it's suicide or not, one of the things that's done is what's called a psychological autopsy. You look into that person's last uh, days, their frame of mind, uh, their attitude, any, anything that could be brought to bear. And I've actually worked on a, um, cases like this uh, where a family would give me permission through their attorney to uh, violate their loved one's privacy to the extent that I could have access to their medical records, their talk to, talk to people, get their financial records in the bank, and so forth. And so if somebody has been depressed and talked about committing suicide, that would be relevant, would it not? It's not absolute proof. Everything in psychology is a little fuzzy, but you could make a case that this person was or was not perhaps a very good candidate, and with some other evidence it might tip a balance as to cause of death. So the case I've chosen is the case of the disappearance of Ambrose Bierce, a contemporary writer, a contemporary of Mark Twain and others, and Bierce vanished off the face of the earth in 1913. And this book, um, endorses my theory. I did uh, mas my master's work in English literature and some of my doctoral work on the disappearance of Ambrose Bierce under the rubric of literary investigation. Yes, even I'm a detective even when I get PhDs in English. Uh, let's go for the detective stuff. Forget the criticism. Detective stuff. This is always good. And Bierce, by the way, I, I did a psychological autopsy on beers and working with a psychologist and getting data from, from various places. And here are some things I found. You tell me what happened to Mr. Beers. He had just completed the multi-volume set of his collected works and he was writing friends letters saying things like, this is to say goodbye at the end of a long friendship or my work is finished and so am I. People that say Bierce would not have committed suicide have not read his powerful, powerful essay advocating just such an action. It's called On Taking Oneself Off. <laughs> and he says, he says with all seriousness, before you uh, become a, a decrepit old person and fall down the cellar stairs and become a burden to your family, Take the soldier's way out. His publisher, Walter Neal, said that Bierce, and nobody's ever cast aspersions to my knowledge that Walter Neal was not a reputable and honest man whose word could be taken, that Bierce showed him a photograph of a place in the canyon of the Colorado where, as he said, nobody will ever find my bones, and told him that he had a German revolver for the purpose. Now, I'm telling you all this because if you go to encyclopedias and books and so forth, they'll tell you that Beers disappeared. Nobody has any idea about what happened to Beers. Uh, he went into Mexico, they say, and 
and there were Elvis Presley sightings of beer, I mean, uh, uh, Ambrose Beer sightings. <laughs> and uh, some saw him with uh, Pancho Villa's forces, some saw him with Carranza's forces. Hey, he could have been on both sides. Uh, this old man, sure, he would have been fighting with Pancho Villa, right. And, and so uh, I bothered to go back and get this, this uh, evidence. And there was the, the State Department investigated at the time and could never find any evidence that Ambrose Beers ever crossed the border into Mexico. Instead, I think he did what he said to Walter Neal he would do. He went into the canyon of the Colorado, found a secluded spot, and disappeared. I'll give you a couple of other facts. He closed out his affairs. I don't mean he just went on vacation. He closed them out permanently before he went off. Does this include anybody? And then, if that weren't enough, I found the letter he wrote to his daughter. He said, giving up the family cemetery plot, Ambrose Beer said, and I will quote you, I do not wish to lie there. That matter is all arranged, and you will not be bothered by the mortal part of, signed, your daddy. Psychological autopsy, I leave that with you, but Roy Morris uh, buys my hypothesis and my evidence and has added to it, and that's the latest biography of Bierce. I believe Ambrose Bierce went off and committed suicide. And I think the psychological autopsy shows that. Even more controversial, something called profiling, and I'm just going to give you a very quick idea of that. Uh, Profiling um, often to some people means some kind of almost ESP use by police departments attempting to divine what is in somebody's mind. But if you think of profiling as just sort of like the psychological autopsy, if you use just available evidence that might tell you whether a particular culprit in a crime that's murdered somebody here might have been male or female, might have been young or old might have been a certain size because of a footprint or something. If you just think of all of that, you could think, yeah, no, I could, you, could, you could convince me that you could amass some evidence that might pretty well describe the person that we're looking for. I know sometimes they get into psychological realms and some of that begins to be fanciful, but I just want to very quickly suggest it in a very famous case. Does everybody here know the case of the Piltdown Skull? The um, yoking together of an old human cranium and the jawbone of a an orangutan, uh, to create the missing link. This was a fake fossil, which happened at Piltdown Common in England, in Sussex in 1912. And you may have read that people don't know who did this, and it could have been uh, the scientist Smith Woodward, or it might have been uh, the priest Tiller de Chardin, or, uh, or one whole article uh, in a science magazine proved that it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Why don't you know? He lived just down the road and showed an awful interest in this. Do you need much more proof than that? Yeah, I'd need a little more proof. But if we look at profiling, we find that Charles Dawson was the one person, I've actually charted this, who was present when each fragment was found. Only one person was there for all of them. It was Charles Dawson. Who was it when somebody suggested, well, this might be a fluke, we need to find a second such skull, who found Piltdown 2? That's right, Charles Dawson. Who had a history of fake selling fake Roman artifacts and fake this and fake that. And who had talked about, oh, life was passing him by and he just needed this, this, to find the great find that would seal his great legacy. He just needed that one great find. And shortly thereafter, found the Piltdown skull. So why are we blaming these people like Teilhard de Chardin and Conan Doyle had sterling reputations when we have a, a repeat charlatan uh, with his name written all over it? So I have written about that, and that's my best guess. Though, of course, we don't have absolute DNA proof in that case, but we use the best evidence that we can, make the best case that we can, and we bring forensic science to bear when we can. And finally, the, uh, the case of, and I'm using this one under the, under the headline of pathology, which is a little bit whimsical here, 
as you'll see when you laugh at this picture. <coughs> but this, uh, <laughs> this is actually a very serious investigation. Um, at the Conyers Marion Apparition site, in Conyers, Georgia, when Nancy Fowler was talking to the Virgin Mary each month, Atlanta Channel 5 called me and said, could you come down and investigate this on our behalf for a TV program? Um, among many phenomena, statues were said to have heartbeats. People were reporting this. I had never heard of such a thing, so I show up, and Georgia skeptics are with me and taking this picture, and I open my trench coat, and one of them starts laughing at the stethoscope, and he says, but you aren't actually going to. I said, no, no, I'm, we're actually going to. Yeah, but I mean not really. I, no, a actually really. Uh, but, but there's a sign there that says don't climb up and don't touch the statue. And I said, yes, yes, and we are, we are professional investigators, and we're going to ignore that sign. <laughs> so, so one of you go down the trail there, and if anybody's coming, because we don't want to make a scene here or offend, offend pilgrims. This is not what we're about. Just going just gonna to investigate. Come, come running if, if you see somebody. And very quickly, and I checked a few of these statues. I know you're, you're dying to know, and I, I'm going to tell you there were no heartbeats. Well, you think, well, how did this story get started? Well, the pilgrims were reporting this, but they weren't using stethoscopes, were they? What were they doing? They were reaching up and feeling the statue, and probably, hypothesis, feeling the pulse in their own thumb. Or just imagining, which people are very good at. Whatever it was, the statues, as far as I could tell, when the skeptic was using the stethoscope, no, uh, no heartbeats. I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. And I think we have, I have, by my watch, about seven minutes. So I did pretty well, huh? Under, I mean, under duress. <laughs> it all worked out in the end. And we caught up with the, we caught up with the pictures. So you must have some, some questions. Yes. Um, well, the the last statue, I, <laughs> the last statue of Mary made me um, think of the cases where we had the statues crying blood. Um, do you yes. know anything about those? Or what oh, I do. I do. I know <laughs> Thank a, you. I guess I could have done I know that. a lot about those. Well, um, a good question. Uh, particularly within Catholicism, because there's a, a lot of reliance on holy images, statues, so forth. Also somewhat in, in the Orthodox uh, churches, uh, their icons and so forth. Remember the Protestants wanted to get away from image worship and so forth. They considered a lot of that idolatry. Um, so you don't find Methodists doing much of this, uh, which of course gives me a break there. Um, but any time that you claim that a statue is moving, bleeding, weeping, and all of these have been said at Thornton, California, there was a statue walking around the church. No one ever saw it uh, be put back in its place, but the next day it would be found, moved again, and so forth. You and I would suspect that someone with a key was doing something, right? To suggest, this is, I don't use the word idolatry myself much, but I do have to agree with those people who say, it's one thing to venerate an image you feel is a holy image. That's okay. But when you start attributing to it that it's, Try to use the word from the Frankenstein movie and get this right. It's alive. <laughs> Remember that? Um, when it's alive, uh, this, is, this is crossing a theological line, really, from just venerating to really saying the God's in the statue, and it's, you know, which is too far for a lot of people, including a lot of Catholics. So there's kind of this term called weeping statue Catholics that <laughs> refers to particular people. In any case, I have uh, investigated many of these icons and so forth, sometimes with uh, uh, pretty, pretty clear results. Uh, one in Toronto, I was actually there on behalf of the Greek Orthodox Church of North America. I actually paid, me, paid my expenses for me to come up and investigate because they felt that this particular priest 
who had been defrocked as a priest, listen carefully, for working in a brothel in Athens. <laughs> they felt he was up to no good. He had had a, he had had a previous weeping statue in Queens, New York, and now he was in Toronto, and the church itself, this was too much even for a church that might even condone an occasional weeping icon, too much for them. And I was permitted, I had, this was a great opportunity, I had, they built a shrine around it, I was actually had a carpenter there to dismantle it. Uh, the Ontario Provincial Police Fraud Squad guy was there for me to take samples and sign them over to him at the Fraud Squad. I had police guard outside because this had become a controversy in the neighborhood. It was, it was just a fun moment, as you can appreciate. There I was, news cameras all around me. And, of course, what it was, it was static. There was nothing happening at any time. I was there before uh, this, and uh, you never saw anything happening. The trick is basically you put some non-drying oil, like an olive oil or something that doesn't dry. Linseed oil dries. Put it in your paint. Don't put olive oil in your paint. Everybody got that lesson? Okay and it'll stay fresh looking for weeks or months. And people can imagine that it's flowing because of the flickering light of the candles and so forth. They may think they're seeing, seeing it trickling or something. They're not. I've never seen a case, and I've, I've examined many, many of these icons, including a house full of them. And so they're what I call a pious fraud. Anyway, the, the crime lab showed that it was just a non-drying oil. Who could say who put it on there? Uh, so you couldn't really arrest anybody, but the church, on the basis of my report, um, did declare it a, a, a hoax. And, and so the church. So was I happy to be working for a church? You bet. You bet. Has anyone ever used human cadavers? You know, if you use that, maybe the people in the back could actually hear you. Perish the thought. My apologies to the people in the back. Has anyone ever used human cadavers to test the WIC effect, to get you know, experimental <laughs> yes. data? Yes. At first, when I first started doing this, there were, uh, we're talking about the spontaneous human combustion, you know, the wick effect. Uh, people, one, one scientist started by taking a small amount of human body fat and wrapping it in a cloth and lighting it, and it worked very well. And then people started saying, yeah, but, uh, you know, nobody's, uh, uh, that's, that's not a fair test. You need a whole body. Um, John DeHaan, one of the nation's top fire experts, did it not with a human cadaver, but with the carcass of a pig, and demonstrated for the first time in a full televised uh, uh, experiment that, in fact, the wick effect is absolutely real. And I, I know that the body farm uh, in Tennessee, you know, the forensic place where the cadavers are put out to um, test maggots and so forth, people to donate their body. They, some of these go to the body farm and they're monitored uh, with respect, of course, but it's pretty dicey to use a human cadaver. Uh, very dicey to just go out and do it unless you're a forensic person under the right conditions. But I believe that there have been enough uh, tests with the WIC effect, but I'm not absolutely sure of that. But I know there was a woman, graduate student, uh, in that program who did an extensive amount of stuff with fire death, and I know that she's a skeptic about all of those kinds of kinds of things. Cool. But thank you. Good question. Somebody back there? Yeah, come on up though. Quickly. Is there, um, <laughs> oh, are we over? Oh, no. Uh, we've got... Uh, last, last, question. last question. Is is there a book or a small chapter in one of your books where there are things that you're like, yeah, don't know what it is. I found something, finally. Is that there? I couldn't explain? Yes, sir. Oh, well, I've found things I can't explain, but only be generally because the evidence is not good. I don't know what you think you saw in 1960 when you were driving near Peoria and you saw a bright light that did such and such. I don't know. But when I've had an opportunity to get to actual evidence and, and have a chance to really investigate something, usually I can come up with, sometimes it's not unexplainable, it's quite explainable, but I may have two or three competing hypotheses, all of them perfectly reasonable, and just no way to really tell which one because we weren't there 20 years ago or we don't have that evidence. But in the meaningful sense of it, I've not seen anything that I thought ever in my 40 years now, 41 years as, a, as an investigator, that ever suggested to me that there was a paranormal or supernatural realm. Let me just put it that way. Um, and uh, I've, when I've had a fair chance, I think, to investigate 
uh, as these would suggest to you, uh, they may not all be conclusive, but I think reasonable people would agree with me that I have provided reasonable explanations for, for these for 41 years now. And thank you for your support. Thank you so much.